Well, welcome to another episode of The Leadership Enigma. And it's time to go a little deeper. And it's time to go a little deeper in relation to our CEO series. But we're linking this to really the conversation around money. What does it mean? It means something to all of us. What is its purpose? What is its real value? What do we do with it? Do we crave it? If so, why? Do we really need it? Well, I have so many questions. And again, like always, I have to talk to someone far wiser than myself. So come back to me just after this, where I talk to Stuart Cash, who is the co-founder and CEO of Ytree. Intrigued? Come back to me. Hi, I'm Adam Pacifico, and welcome to The Leadership Enigma, a world-ranked, award-winning podcast that's insatiably curious as regards what leaders do, how they do it, and importantly, why. We'll delve into the human doing, but even deeper into the human being and the power of human-centered leadership to drive sustainable change. So whether you're an entrepreneur, business owner, corporate executive, each week we speak to global experts, academics, rising stars, ambitious upstarts and disruptors, as together we will discover that success leaves clues. Stuart, it's a massive warm welcome to The Leadership Enigma. How are you? Great, lovely to see you. I think I've just had a slightly intriguing in, <laughs> yeah. uh, intro there to you. And when I mentioned Ytree, probably I'm thinking, hang on, what's all that about? Yeah. But just tell us a little bit about you. Who is Stuart? Who is Stuart? Yeah, that's a good question, right? Grew up in the leafy suburbs of northwest London in Stanmore. You and me alike, right? So, um, yeah, schooled in Elstree. Um, educated and went into study law, Cambridge. Um, and then dabbled a little bit in the law. I qualified and left the next day. And <laughs> Another then, recovering lawyer. Exactly. Brilliant. Yeah. There's a real so theme at the more, moment. Just wasn't in it for me. Um, and then and then I moved into investment banking, okay. um, corporate finance. I worked in a range of different sectors. Um, a lot of it focused on media technology, and uh, moved out to New York actually in 1999, and um, switched from what was then S.G. Warburg to Goldman Sachs just when the market was crashing. Right. Um, so that was kind of 23 years ago. Pretty similar period to how it feels now in terms of people looking at technology valuations. 23 years later, it's the same story. That we've gone full circle. Yeah, amazingly. It's strange, isn't it? Yeah. So history repeats itself. Let me ask you a question. I've got to ask you the question yeah. about the law. Why law in the first place? And then why not law? You know, I was... Um, deciding what I wanted to do for a degree and um, it felt like it would be really interesting to study law yeah and then while I was studying it thinking you know is this really what I want to do for a, for a living and I was trying to convince myself not to took on articles and then yeah you went to a decent firm in town it's okay yeah, yeah. Now, now called BCLP <laughs> they've probably changed their name exactly yeah. okay no so it was um, it was good it's a good discipline I think it gives you structured thinking at the time, you don't necessarily realize how it might help you. We were young. Yeah. I'm used exactly. to the role we there. You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, but you, you practiced longer than me, I think. D just slightly longer. Exactly. But so, yeah. It, you know, it was, um, it's a great discipline, but it wasn't really for me. I, did, I felt that uh, I wanted to, interestingly, know why things were happening rather than actually implement them. Right. And by moving into investment banking, I had the chance to uh, understand why companies were doing things, why they were valued in a certain way. Um, why company A was buying company B, um, and to really understand more about how the economy fits together with different sectors. So that was more interesting than getting the deal done for me. So that's interesting. So when you, you kind of quit the law and moved into investment banking, was that born of curiosity, do you think, or interest in the financial side of things? Because I, I would run a mile from the financial side of things. Yeah. There's a reason that I did law, that's because yeah. I was rubbish at maths. But for you, what was, what was the draw maybe to investment banking? I thought it was a really fascinating industry. You could just learn about new industries. You could learn about existing industries um, and understand how things fit together. Um, and that kind of dri it's kind of drives my passion to really get to the bottom of why things happen. Right. Uh, what's the motivation behind them? Um, Where's that come from then? I'm just a curious person, I think, really. <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think lots of stuff comes from your family. I think, I think my parents are curious people and driven people and... and lots of my values come from them okay so I, I think yeah that's but and i think I, my schooling was like that you know i was at a, a school that was kind of for me enjoyable challenging but for some it was kind of yeah quite 
quite difficult. And I, I, at the time, I just enjoyed it. It's in Elstree. It's probably the same school that my wife went to. Right, but exactly. <laughs> the boys in the, the girls' school. school. That's right. And, and there was like an <laughs> electric gate between the two. <laughs> <There> was. <But> <laughs> We're talking about the same place, yeah. Exactly. So for me, it was... Um, it was a kind of bit of a sink or swim environment there. You were really told like... It's quite a high pressure environment. Definitely. But I think I enjoyed that. Okay. It really appealed to me. Not character. for everyone. No, I think I realized that afterwards there were friends of mine who said they really hated their time there. And yeah. for me, it was... Which is a shame, isn't it? When yeah. you're that young and spend yeah. so much time. Yeah. Let's see. That's interesting, isn't it? So investment banking, was it what you thought it would be or hoped it would be? And if so, how fast was it for you? And rest of, okay, I found my place. It's uh, a really exciting environment to be in when you're young and you're learning because you get to meet with business leaders really early on. Yeah. And um, so for me, sitting in a room with a chairman or CEO when you're in your mid-20s and it's you and at that time a, an MD and yes. you're kind of quite into just doing everyone else's job instead of <laughs> waiting to... <laughs> you know, pick up the mantle from the next partner that retires in a law firm. For me, it was really interesting that I could just uh, find a way to, to advise, understand things and be part of a, a discussion that was quite high level. Was it greater opportunity sooner within that sector than it was perhaps if you're thinking of the, the life within a law firm? Definitely more experience, definitely right. more exposure, definitely the chance to, um, to talk with more senior executives, understand what drives them. Yeah. Um, with lawyers, you, you would work with them, but of course they'd get involved later on around around the transaction. So that's interesting. Yeah. So it's interesting you've got that, that ability to compare and contrast. Listen, I, I want to ask you, because obviously you spent some time in New York, but yeah. actually you were in New York, weren't you, for 9-11? I was actually, So yeah. that's a real personal experience. Tell me a little bit about yeah. that. Um, well, I, I was actually underneath the first tower when the the plane went in. Wow. Um, in, a, in a yellow cab, um, driving down to to Goldman Sachs in, the, in, in, in there near Wall Street. Um, and I remember a sound of, it sounded a bit like sonic boom yep. um, of, of an aircraft, which I thought was probably just like a light aircraft going into, you couldn't even see from that vantage point into the building. And then- But it was obviously something had happened. Something happened, sound, people right. were screaming. You could kind of see shards of glass and wow. you know papers falling. That's about but as close as you probably want to be, isn't yeah. it? With yeah, and, but I remember then going to whatever it was, I think it was the 16th floor at Goldman, and right next to my little office was a, a TV room, and we right. were all watching the TV, and no one knew what had happened because the first plane, um, if you recall, people had no idea what, it, what was going on. Oh. When the second plane went in, that's when everyone said, ah, oh, there's something really right. serious going on. So it's a pretty scary time. I remember being in uh, the building when the towers went down, and even on the 16th floor, it was pitch dark at about whatever it was 10 30 in the morning 11 o'clock in the wow, morning just from just from the dust and the rubble yeah and then walked home after that so i was lucky not to get caught in the whole all, all of the dust clouds because uh, that's having a huge impact on so many yeah lives and yeah and continues to have an impact even though yeah. you know the many who lost their lives on, on the day yeah what kind of impact did that have on you being so close to something that, that changed the world yeah i think um the really interesting thing was looking at New York as a city that is yeah. quite renowned for being a bit frenetic. Yeah. Um, and so seeing New Yorkers dealing with that adversity was quite interesting. People really came together. You know, you had firemen that were hugging people yeah. uh, on that day. People were really coming together, thinking about what was the impact on their lives. People were trying to search for people they didn't know where they were. Right. Um, you'd be walking around downtown New York, and there were photos everywhere in every coffee shop. Every shop had lines of photos looking for people. Wow. And so it kind of brought the city really together. Did you and stay in the city after it happened as well, or did you end up coming back to the well, UK? We, we were living at the time um, in Tribeca, which is, I think it was like 11 blocks away from right. Ground Zero. Yes. Um, at night, you could smell the smoke coming from Ground Zero because it was still smoking for a long time. Wow. And you heard the lorries going by. Um, taking away the rubble down the streets so it was pretty it was a really harrowing time i'm hoping at some point that one of the uh, the chief fire officers actually is is coming on the show really he dealt with 9 11 so it's it's uh, you know i hope you don't mind me asking about no. that because you know there, there are so many things that shape us and have an impact on us one of the reasons actually and this is where i put two and two yeah. and come up with five is yeah. 
you know you talk very much about the people impact and the human impact yeah. it's undeniable with with that but you're quite people and human focused as well yeah. and i, I want to talk a little bit about you the essence of you mm. before i go on to what you founded and the role that you have at the moment as yeah. ceo and, yeah. and what the, what that's doing but you know think about the experiences that you've had through school the law the investment banking 9 11 other things that have happened to yeah. you did you have a sense of the kind of leader that you would be before you started y tree no <laughs> okay no i don't think so um i think i've discovered more in the role um I think when I look back, um, you can look at someone's career and you can think, well, they were a real success. Right. Because um, you can look from the outside and say, well, you know, they became a partner at Goldman Sachs. It looks like you've reached the pinnacle of the investment banking community. On paper, uh, right? Uh, yeah, it's exactly. That. And um, I've never really wanted to define myself by my title or my role. I don't like to go out and dine out on it, if you like. Yeah. Um, but I think when I when I look back to my career, it was full of times where I was digging deep. So I think of being a very resilient person. But I look at it when I was in my childhood, you know, in my part of my um, when I was at school. Um, I remember uh, being predicted two C's and a D for my A levels, right. and thinking, well, maybe I, maybe I just don't want to go to university. And I think that made me dig deep and try and pull it out of the bag. I, you know, ended up doing pretty well. Um, I remember when I was at Cambridge in my first year, I was playing lots of sport. Right. Um, and couldn't couldn't really play more than half time football, be on half time because I had so much pain in my back. I went to see a specialist. Right. He gave me uh, an injection to put and uh, put uh, anti inflammatories in my back. Yes. I ended up with a lumbar puncture, which is something you get when you <laughs> right when you're at that time giving birth but that for me meant i couldn't work my second second term uh, but i did okay in, in that and i think it's 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 those kinds of things that i think mark you as a leader i think it's really interesting today especially when we think about um generational differences between my generation gen x gen z yes. and people's approach to how they think about career life dealing with setbacks especially when you're having to manage and lead yeah, it's Multi really generation. Yeah, so I think resilience is really important. Where'd that resilience come from? Definitely my parents. Definitely my parents. Tell me more. Um, well, I think uh, they've got a very positive attitude to life. Right. Um, my, uh, I've got two siblings. My sister's a physio. My brother's um, works in a, a tech business doing voice recognition tech, but he's he's cerebral palsy. Right. Um, and so growing up, the three of us, um, with a younger brother who's handicap you know really smart guy but physically handicapped yes um we never really thought of him as a different person in our family as a handicapped person and right. my parents always had that sense of if things aren't going well dust yourself down and move on and we treated my brother as just a regular person in the family okay. <clears throat> and they had that attitude towards him which is just be like everyone else you know drive a car ski if you can ski which he does um and he, he's been doing a sales job for a while. Those kinds of things make you look at someone else and think, well, if, if they're... It's quite inspiring. It's quite inspiring. It? And I think he has that impact on people. So that I think that attitude of, of um, whatever adversity you've got, deal with it and keep going is definitely something I got from my parents. And this is why I'm always fascinated <coughs> with these conversations because, you know, we start to dig into the human being mm. over the human doing. You've already achieved... Yeah huge amount and we're going to come on to what you're doing right now but i'm always fascinated by the being side of things what yeah. have you experienced and what what's been the impact on you uh, i want to talk a little bit about what you're doing now yeah um but just to tell us at what point because uh, it was three of you who decided to co-found yeah. y tree yeah. and i think you're an eclectic mix aren't yeah, you in some ways you've got a uh, the complete skill set between you um right. but just just tell us when and how you decided that you were going to start your own business which is now over 160 people strong so yeah. that's some going but when was it well i was at goldman um in 2014 2015 right um i was running a business that was doing asset liability man management for pension funds okay um 
See, that's why but, I did law, Stuart. Exactly. <laughs> well, you know, it was much better being. You got me. A, I tell you what, it was better being a tech banker. <laughs> much better, much better, much better. Uh, you know, dinner party conversation than saying I, I'm a pensions advisor. But um, no insult to people who advise people. No, no. Pensions. <laughs> but I did it for a while. Um, I would just say that um, it's a really interesting area which impacts the whole economy. Yeah. Um, Pensions basically getting salary for the rest of your life. The old-fashioned defined benefit pension mm. means that when you've got some of these large employers like ICI and Boots and W. H. Smith and yeah. Lloyds Bank, basically you've got your current workforce they get paid, and then you've got your former workforce that's getting paid salary with inflation yes. for the rest of their lives. And then there's often a spouse pension, which is fifty percent of the original. So dealing with that problem was a big thing. Those older pensions, those final yeah. salaries, guilt-edged. Yeah, exactly. In the, especially the public sector. Yes. Because yeah. obviously, I, as you know, I spent some time within the police, and those were yeah. final salary, yeah. guilt-edged in many ways. Yeah. But don't get wrong; you, you certainly have to work for it. Yeah. But, but it's an amazing value. Yes. Um, so we we were dealing with that. Right. So-called assets sitting in the pension trust, liabilities, effectively paying the pensions. Yeah. And I was interested to see that people had the same problem in their lives. So if you think about people who don't have a guilt edge pension, basically you go through the first part of your life when you are being paid for by your parents. They pay for your food and your clothing and holidays and going out and Hopefully. school and all that. Hopefully, yeah. And then um, you go through a period when after education, you hopefully earn some money. You hopefully can save some money. If you save some money, you're building up savings, yep. capital, house maybe, mortgage. And then you're building more capital, hopefully, over your life until you get to a point where you either don't want to work or you can't work. Yes. And hopefully you can keep up a similar standard of living. And that's asset liability management. Um, people now talk about the 100-year life rather than you know, 60 or 65 years. And that means you need your money to go a long way. That's quite frightening in some ways, isn't it? I was thinking to myself, my word, I may have got this all wrong. <laughs> yeah. But, but yeah. That, that is quite a frightening yeah. prospect. Yeah. So large part, if you think about it, even from a society point of view, mm. the fact that large numbers of people will be living post-work in so-called retirement, probably with better health because we've looked after ourselves and better medication, it's quite a big impact on society. And the demographics of some countries probably may create even more problems. Hasn't China got a, a demographic where they have, they're have they going to have way more yeah. people now coming through yeah. middle age into the latter part yeah. and probably not enough of a, a younger population to be able to sustain it? So I, I'm not sure how that works. So No, it's difficult. It's challenging. So you were fascinated about this. So tell me how you kind of met your, your co-founders and, and you, you branched into the idea of why tree i think i've just done a pun without it meaning to but how, tell us a little bit about that. Yep. how you met and you you know together you thought i know let's do why tree and then well, we can talk about what it is interestingly we were all kind of rowing our own boats yep um i was looking to help people who worked in large companies engage with their money i realized people didn't understand that they needed to save yes um so i was working with a few relatively well-known employers in the uk about giving their employees money in the palm of their hand, right. seeing everything, seeing how you could compound it over time. Um, I was doing that for a, about a year, thinking about how I would do that. Um, and then I met with Eric Perrett. He's the tech chap, right? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. He's a um, really interesting entrepreneurial guy. We met on a dog walk on Hampstead Heath. <laughs> Very <laughs> serendipitous. Where else would you in Northwest London, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, I was being sort of my typical cheeky self because he spoke to his dog in Hebrew and said, Boena, which means come here. Right. And I said, oh, your dog speaks Hebrew. And that's literally how we met. Um, and so we just started chatting about what he was doing. He was building a challenger bank. Right. Um, trying to work out if he could build something that was going to take on the big banks I'd today. Be a, be a disruptor. Exactly. Right. I was building more of a long-term savings kind of business yeah. about where your money was going to take you over time. Um, so we put our heads together and talked about life and walked in the heat Having of the dogs. Having met on the park. Isn't this crazy, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, amazing. And he brings with him, you know, really good understanding of how to grow businesses from scratch. Yeah. You know, I'd always been working in some blue chip organizations with large companies, right. advising big corporate clients. He brought with him really good understanding of how to be a scrappy entrepreneur, do it in what he calls a low risk way, right. which might, people might think, explain to me what's low risk entrepreneurship depends on the individual maybe <laughs> yeah and so um 
it was a really good mix from you know technology digital product with my understanding of corporate finance and complex advice yes and then um we then met with johnny hampel who had actually been a, a real lawyer because he worked at you know well-known law firm for yeah. about six years and then he uh, was building He's now another recovering lawyer right exactly <laughs> exactly so he um he actually spent two years at goldman but we didn't meet then oh um, wow working with private clients yeah but then he went to um partners capital which is um really outsourced chief investment office that started with wealthy individuals okay. running the big private equity firms right um and some of the hedge funds and then they moved into foundations and okay. colleges a and um he brought with him an under really good understanding of people he's an amazing relationship person right earns trust really fast and really wants to do the right thing by the individual okay and so it was a great it was a really obviously he understands investment really well he's very passionate about that so it was a really good blend of skills to roll up into you know creating three people founding a business so help us understand what is y tree y tree is um a business that sits on top of the wealth management industry we're a new category yes. in personal financial services um you can think of us as giving you a service that creates transparency over all of your financial services providers so it could be a clearing bank or it could be um a wealth manager, it could be an IFA, um, it could be a mortgage provider, at some point it might become an insurance company uh, that you would sit over. So we're looking at all of that, aggregating everything, giving you real transparency. The other thing that we found is people don't really understand what's going on across their financial affairs. It's quite complex, even for people who are former colleagues of mine in financial services. Right. So giving people that understanding is really important. That's the second thing that we okay. do. And then the third thing is that the industry is quite opaque. People don't really see what they're being charged. They don't really see where there's value being created. So we create um, a lot of efficiency, a lot of value creation um, that the industry leaves on the table. Or sometimes, you know, it's fees that you yeah. kind of need to reduce. So really for us, a business that's creating transparency, real meaning or understanding and, and real efficiency. Um, for people's financial services. And was it one of you that landed on this as the, the, the business of choice or was it a collective where you just I, discussed it and it, and it It's kind of, kind of funny, the these things are organic. I was building this sort of long-term mm. asset liability management business for humans. Yeah. Uh, Eric was building sort of near-term experiences around your money. Johnny wanted to build something that was really transparent and efficient for people to manage their money, so investments. And we put our ideas together and said, you know, this is what we're going to build. Right. So when we we're kind of almost the opposite of the industry because we don't charge for assets under management. We just charge for advice, insight. Um, and so the industry charges for the products. Okay. And we charge for the insight. So how do you, where are you, where's the data coming from? Are you being able to tap into yeah. other systems or h how, because obviously you you want the data in order to create yeah. the insight. Yeah. How are you gathering that data? We collect it right. um, using whole range of different technologies yeah some that start manual and become completely automated but you know we've integrated now with over 40 of the world's largest wealth managers so right um when someone comes along that is working with a provider that we don't integrate with then that just becomes another chance to build the next integration and they're all happy to, for that integration to take place what's the benefit for them well um for the client it's great yeah. um to be honest i think that most private banks, wealth managers would love to provide an integration service. Right. Um, they generally don't see the whole balance sheet for their clients. Yeah. So coming in independently as a non-product provider gave us quite an interesting way to build that transparency. So at some point, it may be something we provide to the industry, but it's not something that they normally provide themselves today. When we talk about wealth management and sometimes global wealth management, we're actually talking about high net worths. And is that a, a, a category that creates its own nuance or challenge itself when dealing with high net worth individuals? Definitely the needs. I mean, one of the, my discoveries, sadly, when I started yeah. looking into could we build an asset liability management business for humans was there is a small proportion of the, of the um, population that actually uses wealth management. I mean, 
of the world of, of the world by number is over 50 percent of the wealth yeah that's kind of scary isn't it when you very say that out loud so one percent is 50 percent of the global wealth yeah it's probably greater now after inflation over the last few years yes it's really startling w originally i was doing research in um supermarkets because that was yeah at that point potentially a client base i was going to work with was people working for the supermarkets um and it's quite harrowing sitting on the shop floor listening to people talk about money because most people in that so let's say 90 80 90 percent of the population are thinking about how will they Make last the through the next through to the next and, pay and packet. it's critical <coughs> at the moment yeah in the current and that, climate and that's not wealth management that's expense management and it's debt consolidation and, and cost reduction yes it's not about wealth management so really you're operating for the one percent we're operating probably for the top five percent ultimately but yes. right now we're in we're, we're in the top one percent and there there are six hundred thousand people out of 66 million that have got more than a million pounds in the uk that's that's the top one I, I find the whole thing quite startling actually and, and i and we're gonna i'm doing another podcast actually i'm hoping sooner rather than later we're looking at really the meaning of money mm. but tell me a little about your thoughts about what are you doing this what is it you want people to achieve what does money do for people what's the you know you talked about bringing money to life or yeah. turning money into life help us understand that that thinking that mantra we think of money as the enabler right experiences yeah life experiences um money's there to be spent so if you flip the whole uh, concept of wealth management is, is to think of it as spending yes that's really what we're focused on that's where our purpose starts with the client we well, start so you saying, can't take it with you yeah the old adage but that's right but it's really about sitting down with a family yes being really inclusive um about what the family wants to spend their money on whether it's on them as a couple or whether it's their children or whether they're things they're interested in society yeah. um, whether it's education whether it might be the next generation um, whether it's charitable whether it's their parents to give back um, for these people it's really interesting for them to start to think about what their money can do for them and then interestingly to have the confidence to know they can afford to do the things that they aspire to it, it's an amazing thing how it's quite um, personal, isn't it, for people? Because, I mean, let's be honest with you. I don't, yeah. That's not just a British thing. Um, people don't tend to like to talk about money. Yeah. So uh, are you gathering any insights as you're talking to people with resources, with finances, when it comes to talking about, well, hang on, what is it you want to experience in life through the money? What is the legacy that you want to create or provide yeah. as opposed to just what's the next vehicle you want to buy or something? You know, exactly. Are, are, you, are you getting some insights or smart hard moments as you're having these sure. conversations with the 1%? For sure, for sure. Um, one, one really interesting, there's so much psychology around money. Right, I bet. Um, and I'm sure you'll have experienced as, as you went through your career and you earned a little bit more. You'd spend a little bit more. Right? We all do that, I think. And then, of course, you go through tough times, you might spend a little bit less. But um, I think generally, as people accumulate more and yeah. they earn more, they spend more, and then their lifestyle grows. And so it's really interesting to see people that have more money also having similar, obviously, real for what you might call first world problems, <laughs> thinking about what would I do with my money? Right. Um, and so that psychology of how much is enough is really interesting. Um, and then... Do you think people if should know that? Because otherwise, when do you ever win? Or do you, is it, because um, there are many people out there who just keep chasing yeah. and chasing and chasing. Sure. And so, ha you know, how many yachts and how many houses and yeah. how many cars? Yeah. A and that can be relentless. I always think that's, maybe that's my excuse for not having a yacht. I don't know. <laughs> but I always think, I wonder whether that's incredibly tiring and debilitating when you just don't know when you've won. Yeah. yeah. Is that even a thing? I think everyone's got different right. psychology around it. I think... I, um, I wouldn't want to take away from people their desire to have another house or yeah, have another of course. something like a yacht or a car. That's fine. Um, and also in their in their daily lives and uh, work the next deal and making more money from the next deal, that, that's something that does drive people. So I don't think there's anything wrong with having no. that ambition, that passion, that drive. Um, but to get philosophical about it, when you think about people that leave legacy, Yes. It's not really, a lot of the time, the legacy isn't about the money. It's about the values that they pass down. You think of leaders that 
passed down values, often some of them can be long, young, like you know, Martin Luther King or John F. Kennedy, yes. um, people who pass down values. Um, even if you go back biblically, you think about shepherds who left values that still exist today, didn't have much money to pass on values that we talk about. Well, well, well this is kind of takes me to, you know, when we first talked, there's this fascinating discussion, isn't it, that we're going to have, I hope now, is about value and values. Yeah. Because I think if people think about wealth yeah. and wealth creation, they think about what is the value that I have and yeah. what maybe does that buy from a value proposition but you're talking yeah. about values yeah and i know you've you've really thought about this and this is perhaps part of your dna as a ceo and you know with over 160 people within th this will be part and parcel of who you are as an organization yeah. so tell me a little bit about your thinking about this whole aspect of value and values yeah what are your thoughts well I, i'm going to go to values i think mm -hmm. um because we we care about them a lot at white tree um and i think when we hire people I'm realizing more and more we hire for their competence, technic technical skills and experience. But the most important thing is their mindset, their values. That's the thing that really drives the organization. You can't yeah. build a business unless you've got great people. Is that is that competence almost table stakes? And then once the table stakes yeah. are in place, you're really looking for what you think really kicks yeah. in, and that's the value piece, the culture yeah. piece. And I think I, I look back on my career and I think about some really smart people I work with. Yeah. But I think the differentiating factor of what has an impact in an organization is normally the behaviors not the smarts there's many smart people around but i think we look at the people we really think can impact the organization it's how they work with others yeah it's the impact they can have and that's driven by the way they behave so w we've brought in three values um at y tree yeah um, tell us about those i've got them in front of me but I'd, I'd, yeah yeah <laughs> let me well, yeah, you'd say them. W we think the essence of our business is time. Tell me more. Um, well, in a business where compounding is a really big impact. Yes. Starting earlier. Um, earlier means the better. The better. Yeah, and that means that if you're just saving half a percent or one percent or compounding a little bit more value yes. of half a percent or one percent, it's massive over time. Um, so that's the essence of our business. But we also want to give people time in our business because they want to spend the time with their family and their friends and doing the things they value in life. And so when we think about our business, it's the essence of our service is to give people more time, quality time. And then it pervades into the way we think about how we are with ourselves. So right. being generous with our time to give to our colleagues so they understand more about our business as they're coming on board. Um, so training them, being respectful of someone's time uh, being responsive it's all part of the culture that we want to build that will enable us to be the same between ourselves and our clients so that we keep that, that same thought process i'm racking my brain Stuart, as you're explaining that to think is there another business i've worked with where time was one of their values and i, I can't at the moment yeah so that's really quite unique to it's you. really interesting and it's interesting here how you explain it and the narrative behind it so yeah. time is is the first one but also by the way being succinct you know, really being respectful when you're with a client, you're going to give them an answer that's not overly complicated, but just gives them the essence. It's a real art. Uh, I think it's a real mark of a great advisory business to give succinct advice. That's time. So maybe what we weren't taught when we were lawyers. <laughs> maybe yeah. So uh, it, so that's the time one. Yeah, um, the togetherness one. Yep. Um, I think it's about creating a high-performing team. Um, it's about caring for each other. It's yep. about being really open. It's about making feedback a really critical part of the culture, probably the core. Because I, 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 my experience, until we brought in really a really interesting way to give feedback into our organization, is that you get your annual review. That's right. pretty normal for a large that organization. one time in the year. Yeah, you get scored. Yeah, God. You, I think it's still the same pretty much in most organizations oh, today. It is. Um, you get scored. You Surprise. Go, you sit there. <laughs> <I> know, yeah. <laughs> you get all the, all the positive attributes. Then you get your developmental points. And then you your say, head's in a spin. Can you not have told me that seven months ago? So yeah. I could have done something about it. So, and, yeah. and, you, and then you think, well, what am I going to do with it? So mm. for us, feedback is about continuously trying to help people, seeing feedback as a gift. That's really a big part of togetherness. Right. I always love it when people say that because it, it's the one gift that no one really wants. Yeah. <laughs> because of the way it's done. It's the hardest thing to yeah. do. It's no, the hardest I'm with thing you. To. So that's, to us, that is the concept of... Um, 
really trying to help us be the best that we can be right for ourselves and for the for the business that's the togetherness the responsibility part we actually brought in recently it that to me is all about um clarity of execution right. um clarity of who is going to drive processes and also realizing that when you're leading you don't have to be doing as in if you're a facilitative collaborative leader yes then your job is to bring the collective thoughts of the organization to be really clear about what you want and and to make sure that you're engaging people in giving you thoughts challenges it's quite it's a difficult thing to do but i think i, I always feel upset if i have a meeting and i don't get any comments so do you when you look at these values of time together and the responsibility do you in some ways see how all of these are anchored in you who you are the dna that you have the experiences that you have I think they are because I wouldn't be comfortable with them because yes. it needs to be authentic. I do think, though, it's a real reflection of the, the, the three founders. I think culture comes, it's amazing how culture in a business and values come from the personality of the founders. Right. And we spent time. So I do think it's a reflection of the three of us and definitely the organization, the brand. is. A, is a when did that start to happen for you as, as the three co-founders? Because I'm sure when you probably started the business and it's, it's all hands to the pump and yeah. all hell is breaking loose and you are getting the first people through the door. When, at what point did you start to become deliberate about, hang on, we really need to think about our culture. Yeah. We need to think about values. And we need to think about the human being side of those who are coming in doing things for us. When did that become deliberate? Um, early 2021. Uh, we okay. did a couple of things. Just coming out of the pandemic, weren't we? Yeah. Well, no, we were still we going, really, in yeah. some ways. Yeah, I mean, that was kind of the next wave, if you like. Um, I say it was then we, first of all, we started actually to take um, exec coaching into our business then. Okay. Um, and we realized that because we were gonna grow quite substantially as a business, yes. that a lot of us might need some help thinking about how we grow culturally as an organization and to give people some tools to be able to use to, to grow yep. teams. And so that was probably one of the best things we did actually was, was hiring coaches for the three of us and then for our team leaders because we have a group of about 13 of us now including right is the that the management team or the yeah we call team it team leaders yeah. um and <coughs> so that's across all the areas of the business right and and that enables us to grow as a group to be more candid as a group yeah to understand how to operate more effectively and communicate more effectively and to deal with more challenging situations in uh in a, in a really constructive way but it also enabled us to think about how we grew as individuals and understand each yeah. other, um, thinking about what's in, in the other person's head rather than your own head. So what type of CEO do you think you're becoming? Because you're learning and you're working, Definitely. we're all work in progress and you yeah, talked about course. having a coach. So yeah. I, I'm not asking the question of what kind of CEO are you? In some ways I'm saying, what, what, what kind of CEO are you growing into, do you think, as part of parcel of your journey? So um, for me, candor is really important. Right. I like to be able to say what I think. Um, I like to be really open with people, sometimes even alarmingly open. But right. I just say it the way it is. I uh, don't really like well, it's to. Boarding on radical candor? Well, maybe not in the sort of Ray Dalio context, yeah. the same way of that radical transparency and let's review each, each other at the end of the meeting. And n not quite. I may get there actually at some point. Um, but personally, I feel comfortable when I can tell people yeah. what I'm thinking and not hold stuff back. It's a really interesting... And vice versa, for people to tell you exactly what they're thinking. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, because and otherwise, how are you going to develop self-awareness? How are you going to grow? It's just yeah. impossible. So we are works in progress. Always. It's, and it's, it, it's one of the most difficult things to be able to obtain feedback on yourself. So you have to make yourself vulnerable yes and i've found a few things i found in my journey in this sort of the last few years first of all i found that talking about what you're working on as a person yeah is really um empowering for the group because they suddenly see the someone who's happy to be open about the fact that there are things they need to improve on and then they start to realize well they're not perfect none of us are perfect so that's a good thing and it, it means you can yeah. be comfortable and not feel like you have to be this um, 
this facade there's no reason to have that it just makes you feel actually more impactful if you're open rather than try and put up some some mask that i think you've talked about before. well that's interesting because <laughs> you mentioned that you listened to uh tim kresik's episode yeah. which yeah. was uh, he's the ceo of vorbos yeah and again a fairly young ceo who yeah. you know describes himself how he saw almost overnight great success yeah he hasn't changed, but maybe how he's perceived has changed. Yeah. But he's also talked about how the human being and the human doing of, of he can't detach them. Now, you come from some traditional businesses, law and investment banking, where in, let's remember it now, and sometimes the 80s and 90s, where it was leave your baggage at the door, yeah. leave your personal stuff at the door and get on and do things. What's your view, though, as a, as a leader and a leader of people in relation to sometimes life just doesn't work properly and we have challenges and... Yeah. Do we separate? Do we just, is it who we are? What, what, what are your thoughts in relation to That's people idea. at work on a, on, a, on a deeply human level? That's a really, really interesting question. So, I mean, I think, first of all, we have lots of people that are dealing with adversity all the time. You know, it could be health. Yeah. It can be relationships. Um, and it is challenging for them sometimes to come into work. We know that. Yes. We really want them to talk about it and see if we can help them. Yeah. Um, so I think you have to be understanding and human as an organization. But I would say that I, I, tr I try when I'm dealing with things in my life, because we all deal with them. Of course. I try not, I try not to bring it into work and it's difficult, but I try to, to go to work, focus on what I'm doing at work. And then when I'm not at work, um, cause I think you, but you're there for other people though, aren't you? Anyone can come to you and as the CEO, 100%. I'm assuming they can come to you and say, listen, I'm struggling with X or I need yeah. a bit of time for Y. So you've got them. Who's got you? Well, I think that's where I feel my business partners really help me. Okay. I mean, there's my family, but I feel that um, I do feel that I can talk with them about things because I want them to understand where I'm at on things, things that could have happened you know, over the weekend or during the week. I think it's really important that you can be open because then there's nothing to hide right. and it enables you just to be just uh, more natural in the way you're interacting. But uh, interesting though, I, I, I have, um, uh, I, I don't believe in work-life balance. And I say- I that, had another CEO who said it doesn't exist. Well, the reason I say it is because I think it's life balance. So, and that's another thing I think it's interesting for us to think about as a business and yeah. then bring to the outside world. Um, if you're in a place where you obviously are in a job that you enjoy, and you're good at it, and you can get paid enough for it, and yes. it's purposeful in the world. With the purpose piece, isn't it? Yeah, then I think you're in a great spot. Um, that's the Japanese ikigai concept, I think. But uh, not everybody has that privilege. But I think we're all aspiring, if we can, to do something that we feel is purposeful, and we enjoy, and we're good at, and we get paid enough. That's a great place to be. And highly relevant if you're trying to attract younger talent and Absolutely. retain them. Absolutely. This is a huge piece of the puzzle, isn't it? Sure. So I think having that purpose um, definitely gives us meaning. It gives our people meaning. Yeah. Um, and I think it just rubs off when you're with clients. So my, my concept of life balance, <clears throat> and it's a little bit privileged to say it, so I kind of hesitate to some extent, but if you're working nine to five, and most of us work a lot longer than nine to five, yeah. let's say eight to six, let's say eight to eight, it's a very large part of your life. If you don't enjoy it, try not to do it mm. go and do something that you will enjoy now i say that it's a little easy to say that when i think i've got to the part of my life my career when i'm really doing something and i'm enjoying and i feel like it's it's purposeful and well, we're getting and I love a more people. philosophical conversation almost aren't we in relation yeah. to to that element and in some ways everyone's looking for that sweet spot yeah as regards what we do yeah during the day and and, and much out there in relation to purpose i'm intrigued three of you co-founded the business you're the ceo yeah how did that come about? I think we've all naturally gravitated to the roles that okay. we are our strengths. I think um, I think it's a good thing to focus on the strengths. So there's certain many things that uh, I, I'm not good at, and, yes. and that's what Johnny and, and Eric are good at. Johnny's amazing with people and clients and earning trust. Right, I can do that, but not in the way Johnny does that. He's right person, very right job, right very, time. Very unusual okay. and very talented. Um, and he's Shout also <laughs> deep, deeply, deeply <laughs> analytical um, it, when it comes to numbers, even though he was a lawyer. Um, right. And um, 
And Eric's really good at breaking down processes and working out what am I going to do tomorrow. And obviously he understands technology yes. and digital product processes deeply. Um, and we've also got very different personalities. And so mine naturally is, you know, fit in the middle is culture. Um, it is strategy. It's marketing. It's our finances. It's relationship with shareholders. Yes. And I think so we're all playing to our strengths, which is a really, it's a lovely thing. Actually. Next week's episode is um, Nick Johnson, who specialised in executive loneliness. He wrote a book on executive loneliness. Have you found it a little bit lonely as the CEO? Or have you been, again, deliberate in relation to, in some ways, again, I come back to this piece about vulnerability, understanding, Stuart, what your needs are, and then having the confidence to go and ask other people to help you with those needs. Yeah. How have um, you operated? Well, it's interesting. I... Um, I was running on my own steam at first, as I said, all three of us were doing our own thing. Yep. And I did find that quite difficult. Yeah. And so in that period, I was definitely looking for a running mate or running mates. I wanted to have- Serendipity. Yeah. Hampstead it Heath. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> but it really, I, I felt I needed to have someone I could bounce ideas off who, yeah. who was gonna have contrasting experience. Yeah. Um, and actually very different way of thinking about the world. I mean, I think of diversity, not just about gender, sexuality. I think about about different brains thinking in different ways. diversity of thought. Yeah. And it, for me, you know, sometimes when you see us in action, we're in very heated debate. Yes. Um, we try and, you know, measure that. But but w I, I, I've realized more and more that the time when you experience challenge is the time when you're experiencing growth. Yes. And it feels might not, yeah might not feel like it at the time. It feels really difficult. Like we always say, we'll laugh about this one day, just not just now. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, exactly. And it's and it's it's when you're in those those moments, yeah. if you can actually realise this is where the growth's happening. Yes. Because you're that challenged. self awareness. Yeah. Early self awareness. Yeah, and it happens a lot. If you get challenged, and you're in a in a meeting, and it's totally um, putting you off of your train of thought, and yeah. and you feel like. Especially with ego, I think it's an interesting thing for leaders to think, I I'm the person who needs to be right in the room. Well, actually, if you suspend your thought and think, actually, ego less, your job is to listen and then be able to bring the most out of people. It's so much more rewarding than thinking you need to be the person with all the right And answers. have those very smart people surrounding you, for sure. Yeah, sure. Um, what's the legacy for Ytree? What, what are you hoping to achieve? Well, if we, if we hit our mission, yes. our, uh, hit our vision, yeah. um, then we'll be making people more conscious around what their money can do for them, especially if we can do it with the top 1%. I, I do feel that their impact and influence is huge. will be greater uh, on society. Right. Um, yeah, so I think that will be that will be our legacy. And it's quite difficult, you know, the in, it's, it's a very, very large industry, wealth management, which we sit on top of. And so to try to transform an industry like that is is quite is quite a challenging thing but it, for us yeah. we feel like we're doing the right thing how do people get in touch with either you or white if they want to learn more or they want to join in the conversation or people say i would like stuart to come and talk to me in relation to x y and z i mean what's the best way stuart well we've got a website <laughs> <laughs> let's give us the url and we'll put so that into the show notes yeah, as yeah, well. we're, we're y hyphen tree okay dot com so why the letter and tree as in Tree. Trees in the forest. There yeah. we go. There's, with there's, with, with a tall, hopefully the tall tree. As simple as that. In, we'll, in a big forest. Yeah. <laughs> we'll put that in there. Yeah. Listen, thanks so much for taking the time to a come into the studio and share some of your thinking uh, around these. I really appreciate it. I hope this has been, uh, it's been uh, fun. fun for you as well. Great. Yeah, really uh, great. In relation to it, and uh, I, you like the new studio? I think I it's keep great. Asking people it's, that, it's, right? Uh, it's techy. I think it's, uh, it's <laughs> very techy. It's very. It's kind of neon. Modern. It's, 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 yeah. uh, well, we've gone for blue. That's our colour. It's, uh, uh, it's a bit nightclub I think. Is it? <laughs> Don't you think? <laughs> it's a bit nightclub James. You're not, yeah, not, not even I listening. I think you can have a few martinis on the side here. Well, can I say, when they do some of the evening pods, there, yeah. uh, there has been the odd alcoholic beverage. Exactly. Uh, I can, I can on, imagine that. On, on the desk. You so this is the a, scene of many pods. Yeah, some great, you know, speakers here pumping the music. We feel right. <laughs> we <laughs> we feel right. Listen, thanks so much for coming. Great, I really appreciate you. it. All right. Cheers. Thanks. Cheers. Cheers. Join us again next week for more curiosity and insight with the Leadership Enigma. We'd love to hear your comments on today's show as well as suggestions for future topics and guests. Get in touch with me on LinkedIn or visit us at www.leadersenigma.com. 
Don't forget to rate, review and subscribe on all your major podcast platforms and on our dedicated YouTube channel. Thanks again for joining the community.